the Lord just dropped the, the face of that man in my spirit. And I just felt like we need to we need to keep him living in prayer. We really don't understand what some people are enduring and experiencing because of their witness and their confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's our um, usual thing that I get into a conversation that is in sync or in line with what it is I feel that the Lord is giving me to share with you. I have a handout and I'll start with with that handout. And then I'll take it into the message. I tried to do my best to help you to understand the word of God. Everyone has one? We know that we are saved by Jesus Christ when we believe in Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. And God decided that he would start a whole race of people, which was the Jews. And it was the lineage of the Jews that God the Father decided that he was going to allow his son Jesus Christ to come into the earth to be the savior of all human beings. I want to start with the scripture we had last week. And it's in the 12th chapter of Mark. So to me, it's a really awesome scripture. And in light of all of the things that we see in the world today, the enemy has done a really good job at making death be fashionable. Death and um, zombieism and apocalyptic type thing, just end time, even though people don't understand what it is that they're embracing the black lipstick and the black... Um, fingernail polish and it's um, Lady Gaga now even has a black perfume and she calls it black goo. Um, CERN is trying to start up the, the, well they already started their collider and what they're trying to look for is dark matter, <laughs> anti-matter. They're looking, for, they're looking for the dark stuff, the creation stuff that they can bring about chaos and God's beautiful creation so that the enemy can redesign it but what people don't understand is anything that the enemy can't create anything so everything that he has anything to do with is death and dark and desolation Jesus says he came to bring us life and to bring it to us in abundance everything that the enemy does is dark and evil and perverted and lawlessness and it's the opposite of God Satan is not the Antichrist is not um, Antichrist or against Christ, the Antichrist is in place of Christ. So he's trying to replace God's goodness and life with death. So in this scripture, in the 12th chapter of Mark, verse 27, it says, God, or he, which talking about God, is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. God, because they are challenging him about who's going to be in the afterlife. They understood all, everything about the afterlife, the underworld, the, the, the netherworld, but they couldn't see that they had the author of life right before their faces. And the Jews rejected the author of life. The Jews rejected Christ, who was the savior of the world. And they continued to practice a form of religion that God the Father, the creator, was finished with. So when we look at the chart that the Lord inspired us to do, we have the unholy trinity side of the chart and the trinity side of the chart. And all of the different people, all of the different religion, all of the different belief systems, they do believe in the same God. But it's not the God of the creation God. Am I making sense so far? So let's turn to Hebrews. And I like to track things down in scripture. And I hope it makes sense to you what what the Lord has given me to share with you today. We've been, we, we're in the period where we get going towards atonement for the Jews. The Jews are still practicing and living under the law that they've really transitioned into satanic worship or Luciferianism or mysticism or Kabbalism. They're not Christians. They don't believe in the author of life. So in chapter 10, 
of Hebrews, verse 20 says, well, let's start at 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. So he tore down the veil that was a separation between man and God. And now he has a new way, not the old law, but a new way. And it's not just new, but it's new and it's living. It's a new and a living way he has consecrated for us, set us apart. And it's through the veil that is to say his flesh. Isn't that awesome? You can't hardly get any clearer than that, can you? So let's turn now back to, we're going to be back and forth. Let's turn back to Mark, chapter 15. Mark, chapter 15. And this is when all of this happened that his, his flesh was torn. In verse 37 of the 15th chapter of Mark, it says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and he gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was ripped in twain or two. And it's from the top to the bottom, indicating that a man didn't get up there and do it, but it was supernaturally done by God. So the veil, the thick veil, that was that was used in the in the law, in the temple of the law, in the old temp, temp, tabernacle or the old temple or the old way of doing things. When Jesus gave up the ghost, this scripture is saying that that veil was torn in two, which means now no man needs to go to another man or woman or whoever to have a relationship with God, to pray to God, to confess their sins or have communion with God. You don't have to do those old things anymore because we just got through reading that through the flesh of Jesus, we have a new and a living way. The old way was dead. It was animals of bulls and goats. And we're going to see that. Go back to Hebrews chapter 9. Am I making sense so far? I want to show you chapter 13 before we look at 9. Let's look at 13. And look at verse 20. It says, Now the God of peace that brought, this is awesome, you should underline this, that brought again from the dead we just got through reading that Mark where he gave up the ghost. Now this scripture says, Now God the Father of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. That blood makes you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever. I wanted you to see Jesus was brought back again from the dead. We just got through reading about when he died, the veil was ripped. Okay? Now turn to the ninth chapter of Hebrews. And let's look at verse 1. So far, is this making sense to you? Now it should make more sense even more than ever, hopefully with the information I have to share with you. It says, Then verily or truly the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Talk about the law and the services that the priests had to do under the old ordinance, under the old way of being made right with God, which was to bring people into a mindset that when they committed sin or what was what sin was, because if God didn't reveal to people that sin was sin or what sin looked like, they wouldn't have been able to, God wouldn't have been able to hold them accountable for breaking any laws because they didn't have any laws. They could live any way they wanted to. So God instituted through Moses the law to the Jews to get them in the mindset of what sin was and what it was going to take to deal with sin and that when Jesus Christ, their Messiah, come into the world, he would be the Savior or the atonement for sin or the payment for sin for everyone. 
Am I making sense? I'm trying to get you to understand how awesome it is what Jesus Christ did. So that we would want to love him and not just live any old kind of way to please ourselves. So reading verse 1 again, it says, Then truly or verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made. The first where and was the candlestick in that first candles in the first temple or tabernacle, the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. This is um, describing the different rooms in the in the in this um, temple or the sanctuary or the tabernacle. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. Now I want to read to you the definition of alchemy. Because what the enemy and the people who's worshiping Satan are doing is they're trying to find immortality which means they want to live forever, but they don't want to live forever based on God's standard of how you get to live forever. They want to live forever based on trying to change human beings into gods. That's what alchemy is, is trying to make lead into gold. Okay? But I'm going to give you another definition that says alchemy is the medieval forerunner of chemistry based on the supposed transformation of matter. Remember I told you they're trying to look for antimatter and control it in CERN. It was concerned particularly with attempts to convert base metals into gold or to find a universal elixir or elixir. So they're trying to take God's creation and change it into a god or immortal. Because that's what alchemy is all about, is changing, trying to create a god. Because gold represents deity. A seemingly magical process of transformation. Check this out. Creation or a combination of transformation, transformation and creation. So by transforming hum, human beings into something that the enemy wants to transform you into, he creates his own creation, which is perverting God's creation. This is what this is really all about. Am I making sense to you all so far? Okay, so now having that understanding, let's go back and read Verse 4 again, it says, Which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, which is food from heaven, and Aaron's, bud that, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of, globe, of glory, shattering the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Because up to this point, doing all of these places, these three places, these three division are rooms in the whole in the temple or the tabernacle or the ark of the covenant that they carried around. Only the high priest could go, and no human being was able to go behind the veil. That veil that was torn when Jesus died is representative here. Now that veil's been torn, anybody can go behind it, but you only can get there through Jesus, through his flesh. Now verse 6, now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second only went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself first for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Talking about the Ark of the Covenant, the way that people worship in the law. While that was still standing, 
the new way, the new and living way was not yet manifest. I want to make this clear to you because the Bible is very clear. Which was a figure for the time then present. And for that present time, that was a figure. So clearly it's telling you it was an example. It was a figure of what was to come. Do you see it? In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pretending to the conscience. The conscience couldn't be made clear or perfect or right with God. Which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances. These are the things they were doing. Imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building so it's not a building that was made of hands that God now has his time of worship neither by the blood